Spoiler warning. If you haven't seen In Space with Markiplier yet, then first of all, why not? And secondly, I'm confused how you made your way here if you haven't. This video will have spoilers for pretty much all of it. There's a link to both part one and part two in the description of this video, so please, if you haven't seen it yet, go play through In Space on your own first, and then come back and watch this video. The same goes for A Heist with Markiplier. There will be a few major spoilers for that adventure in this video, too. I absolutely loved In Space with Markiplier. I can't remember the last time a piece of fiction affected me emotionally in such a deeply profound way. It's just so amazing and cool. My mind can't handle the rendering. So anyway, this won't be a Let's Play style video, since I've already played through the whole story, and it's not really an organized, unbiased review either. This is just going to be me walking you through my own very subjective thoughts and reactions to it all. I'll describe the route I took, and explain my choices and reactions along the way. As a choose-your-own-adventure, I think this experience is very personal to everyone. And I'm not just being polite when I say how much I would love to hear about yours, in as much detail as you feel like telling me about it. Leave a comment, post a video of your own and send me the link, or however you want to do it. I'd love to hear about the journeys of some other captains of the Invincible, too. I've never been one for journaling or keeping a diary. While I can see the value in it for people who want to, for me, I don't really put my thoughts down in writing unless I intend to share them. Otherwise, my thoughts tend to stay in my own head. I guess in a way, you could say I see journaling the same way as a captain's log, a record of my own experiences and or mistakes left behind for others. But ever since I finished In Space, I just haven't been able to stop writing down my thoughts about it. And that's why this video now exists. Because if I'm going to record my thoughts, I want to share them. This video was supposed to only be about 5 or 10 minutes long, by the way. So much for that. Anyway, let me take you through my playthrough experience. Here we go. When you're stuck in a time loop, there's not much point in keeping a captain's log because it will just keep getting reset along with everything else. So now that my journey is over, here is the story of how Mark and I almost destroyed and then saved the multiverse. I managed to go into In Space almost completely spoiler-free. I'd seen the don't clip, of course. Don't. And someone had let it slip that I'd be captain, but I didn't even watch the trailers before starting my journey on The Invincible 2. I'd only just finished a heist, and Darkiplier's warnings about Mark having us trapped in his stories were still fresh in my mind when I boarded the ship. So at first, I was a bit suspicious that Engineer Mark would turn out to be evil somehow. But I quickly abandoned that idea, because it was almost immediately obvious that Engineer Mark is a complete cinnamon roll. Hey, I don't make the rules. When Mark first welcomed me aboard the Invincible 2, and he was so confident and ignoring crew members being injured and dying all around him, he was kind of giving off the same energy as Mac did when I met that character in Part 2. At first I was confused why I was the captain instead of Mark, but when the ship's computer greeted him as head engineer, it all clicked into place, since Markiplier has said before that he could have been an engineer. I could have been an engineer. So, of course he'd be the engineer. Of course! In hindsight, I probably should have been a lot more concerned that we were using an alien warp core we just found floating in space, but it seemed legit at the time. Now, Mark building a star for the main reactor? That I was a bit concerned about. I decided me and Celsi were not going to be friends as soon as she appeared and started arguing with Mark. But also, their interactions throughout the series were hilarious. I didn't recognize Dan at first in his space crew costume, so I had no idea who this goober was that wanted me to catch him. I tell you what, finally stepping out onto the bridge to greet the crew before starting the mission was magical. I was so excited for the journey ahead. I had a bad feeling that we were in for some kind of trouble as soon as I entered the cryopod, and then came within an inch of my life laughing at the software update. Then, of course, disaster struck. 
As you can imagine, I was shocked when Mark got sucked out into space through the broken window. I was so disappointed, too. Was this going to be in space without Markiplier? But I had a situation to deal with, so I made my first choice. Put out the fire. Well, that didn't go well. Imagine my double shock when I found out I was in a freaking time loop and Mark was back after all. Gosh, I was so excited. Even though everything was obviously going wrong as fast as we could fix it, this was indeed going to be in space with Markiplier. All right, listen. I knew that to be a good captain, sometimes sacrifices have to be made. But I'd just gotten Mark back, and I was not going to send him into his death trying to fix the ADS. As for waking up the crew, I was thinking, we don't have time for that, and they're much safer in cryo for now. So fix it from the outside it was. Please tell me I'm not the only one who thought fix it from the outside meant outside the ADS room, not outside the ship. At this point, I was feeling pretty dumb. So far, my choices as captain had been far from the best. I felt bad about Mark getting beat up and thrown around in this route. But I knew it. I just knew the right choice was supposed to have been send Mark in. Oh well. Yeet. Then, of course, Cryo shut down, and it was time for the next choice. I wished there was a choice to send myself in, but there wasn't. And I already knew fix it from the outside meant jump out an airlock, so I had to send Mark in again. Poor Mark! At least it worked. But of course our troubles weren't over. Time to deal with the reactor. When that plasma vented, I was sure Mark got vaporized, but was relieved to see he didn't. Then, of course, immediately, the computer called for not just somebody, but someone with extensive engineering expertise to go in and fix it. Are you kidding me? Now I really felt bad for sending Mark in the last two times, because it was clear this was the time it really needed to be him. It was super hard, especially with Mark begging not to be sent in again. But I was determined to make the right choices, be a good captain, and make the tough calls. So, I decided to send Mark in. Again. Oh no! The demerits! <laughs> now I wasn't just physically bullying Mark, but with the demerits, too. This was not the result I expected or was trying to get with my choices leading up to here. By the way, if you haven't already done it, I recommend you go back and re-watch that video and pause to read all the different demerits on the captain's tablet, because they're extremely funny. At least it worked. Again. Well, I sure wasn't expecting the warp core room to have been completely replaced by a gigantic blue wormhole, but okay. And the event horizon protocol worked and got the ship free, so there's that. But I got the bad end! I was so mean to Mark, making him do everything and not even appreciating him. Oh no. Oh no. This was definitely not what I was going for. Oh my. You know what? Fair. Deserved. Earned. I'd smother me with a pillow too. I was just thinking, wow, I'm a terrible captain. Just one choice this time and I wasn't sure if it led to In Space with Markiplier Part 2, or if it would send me back to the beginning to try a different route. I knew I wanted to explore all of Part 1 first, but I figured if it started Part 2, I'd just go back and finish Part 1 before going any further. So with nothing else to choose, I clicked on Go Towards the Light. I think it was at this point where I truly started to grasp just how amazing In Space with Markiplier is. I expected to be kicked back to the original starting video for part one, or ahead to part two, but just the thoroughness of all the looping in this time loop being put into new and separate videos to chase through the options just sort of blew my mind a bit. Listening to Mark screaming and fixing everything in the background was honestly really hilarious. The troll options at the wormhole got me. I was just realizing that Jump In and Cannonball were the same thing, and wondering which to pick when I got surprised by Mark stopping me. Then, of course, cue the first appearance of Lady. As soon as they appeared, Gun pointed at us, and started talking, I knew immediately this wasn't the first time we'd met, from their point of view. 
but of course I hardly had a chance to react before the explosion sent me and Mark flying through the wormhole. Absolute chaos. Let me tell you, I found the warp core very intimidating, especially when that crystal started zooming towards me. As soon as it attached itself to my glove, though, I started nerding out. This is it! This is the thing Markiplier pulls off of my hand later with the pliers in the don't clip! Don't. I knew it! I knew it had something to do with being able to make choices or some sort of special power! Being given the crystal and then left with the words, please resolve paradox, really filled me with a sense of responsibility that I'd have to be the one to find a way to fix this time loop. And now, it looked like Mark was starting to remember previous time loops, too. Sweet! I watch enough sci-fi to know that it always helps when you're not the only one who can remember what happened before in a time loop. Of course I was tempted to jump in again. But remember, I was trying to be a good captain, and I was trying to learn from my earlier mistakes. Besides, I figured we could always go back and try jumping in again later. No rush in a time loop. So I decided that the most responsible thing to do first was to call an emergency meeting, let the crew know what was going on, and see if anyone had any ideas. Well, so far so good. The crew reacted well to the meeting and started brainstorming. I pretty much discounted Gunther's assertion that it was sabotage. He seemed pretty paranoid to me. As for Celsi's idea to send out a distress signal, I figured space is just too big and too vast. We could be sitting there forever and still not have anyone even hear our distress signal. I liked Bert's idea of backing into the wormhole. It was just the sort of idea that made me think, that's so stupid it might actually work. So I gave the order, pop her in reverse. Oh. Oh no. Okay. Also, the ship's computer is now having an emotional crisis. Also, I'm in an old detective movie now. Okay, I think I broke the universe. Whoops. Meanwhile, I'm just over here minding my own business, trying not to die over noir universe Mark. My face probably turned a bright shade of beet gray when he was inner monologuing about eventually working up the courage to ask me on that date. Don't mind me. Stop looking at me. Anyway, I still didn't see much point in sending a distress signal, for all the same reasons I didn't do it before. Just sitting around wasn't going to solve anything, so I decided to fire all weapons at the wormhole. Hmm. When that phone started ringing, I got a feeling something bad was about to happen. And of course it was for me. What I did not expect was the wormhole to be on the other end of the line. Since when do wormholes talk? Yeah, that didn't work out like I'd hoped. Back in living color, but now there's a narrator? The captain did indeed look around slightly confused. The heck? Absolute chaos! Keep in mind, given my choices so far, I had no clue who Wug or any of these other characters were at this point. From my point of view, we'd never met. It seemed like Wug knew us, though. The captain's deep, dark secret? What? I must not be very bright, because I didn't realize that the narrator must have been referring to the warp crystal I had in my hand. You know what? Throwing vent covers at people's heads has a tiny little tendency to make me not trust a person. Not to mention all the glitching and godlike powers. And then the narrator totally unexisted a crew member before our very eyes. I was absolutely on high alert against him and everything he wanted at this point. Way ahead of you, Mark. There was no chance I was going to make the choice this narrator was trying to force on us and use the device. Literally anything else. Here we go, Plan K. I went from zero to Starfleet Captain This Is My Ship tantrum in 15 seconds. Maybe for some of the other captains out there in the multiverse, it was different. Just really funny blowing up the ship, or another YOLO moment like throwing yourself out the airlock. That's the beauty of a silent protagonist player character, like the captain of the Invincible 2. Frankly, I'm amazed at what a complete and compelling story they put together while still leaving so much up to the player as to how to experience it like that.
Fully half of my playthrough of In Space was happening in my own head, in my own feelings, in my own interpretation of the story. Anyway, then I met Ms. Whitaker for the first time. Of course, I didn't know who she was yet. Not working hard. Not working hard. Come on, I was doing my best. That annoyed me, and I sure didn't trust her any more than I trusted the narrator. I was wondering if they might even be the same alien being, trying to manipulate us and keep the time loop going or something. I was going to fight tooth and nail to break free of this time loop. It seemed like I was finally making some progress, and again I was faced with a single choice. Again I resisted. Well, now I'm not doing it. Hey! She stole my device thing! I knew I couldn't trust her. No regrets fighting back. I was sure that wormhole just led to the beginning again anyway. Then the credits started rolling. I couldn't believe it! Credits and not a numbered ending? Did this mean I got the true end on my very first try? So that was my canon first playthrough of In Space with Markiplier Part 1. But really, after finding my first ending and exploring the rest of them systematically, that exploration kind of became part of my canon first ending, because as the captain of the Invincible 2 I was doing that too, not just looking for completionism and easter eggs as a player. My thoughts while I watched the Frozen in Cryo ending pretty well sum up my whole thought process about it. In the last ten minutes or so of consciousness I have left before the sleep of stasis takes my mind, I take some time to reflect as captain. This crystal thing may be frozen, but things have always reset before. I'm sure they'll reset again this time, probably. All the choices that could have been made, all the realities we could have created have already been created. Mark and the others remember things that I haven't seen happen yet. We're committed to this path. At this point, I have to explore all the different paths, because knowledge is the only thing that will get us out of this now. That space elf lady obviously can't do anything about all this. They're always several steps behind us, and don't seem to know as much about what's happened, even if they know more about why and how. The ice is so beautiful. I only have a little more time left before… what was that? And yes, I did watch the whole 10 minute video of the cryopod slowly freezing. Loved it. As for the third and final possible ending of part one, the first time I saw the lady shoot Mark and he said, Not again! <laughs> I thought he was talking about the time the scientist accidentally shot him instead of me in a heist with Markiplier. But as I got that same ending again and again, and watched him get shot more than 50 times across 8 repetitions of the scene, I started to realize he was actually talking about the time loop itself. Or maybe both. Every time I followed a route through to that ending with Lady, Old Mark, and the Warp Corps, I watched it all the way through again. Okay, listen, don't judge me. If I can watch Markiplier look at a banana or try to dig through a concrete floor with a spoon for ten whole minutes, I can definitely watch and re-watch events I've already seen to make it feel more like I'm actually stuck in a time loop. Besides, each time I watched it, I noticed more details I'd missed on earlier times through. I'm not all that observant when it comes to visual details, so it took me a few times to even realize that Mark threw sand in his own eyes. Or that Lady's hand had gotten severed at the wrist by the very end scene. While I was exploring all the alternate routes of Part 1, I realized something. All the dead-end endings at the start of Part 1 that lead to go into the light punish you with the opposite of whatever you're trying to do. If you rely on Mark by always sending him in, then it destroys your friendship and in the end he smothers you with a pillow trying to stick together only tears you apart. Likewise, if you try to wake the crew after putting out the fire, or tell Mark you believe him about the time loop after fixing life support, you end up alone. Trusting in your crew leaves you completely without one. On the other hand, if you try to get back to reality by telling Mark it's a dream, you get completely out of touch with reality and go into a total state of denial. Instead of seeing through a lie, 
you only end up lying to yourself about the truth. If you make all the right choices from the start and avoid resetting the time loop, fixing life support first and waking the crew to help fix the ship, then Mark stays dead, and in space with Markiplier becomes in space without Markiplier. Trying to do everything right makes the whole premise of the story wrong. If you choose the reckless option by throwing yourself out the airlock again and again, you end up completely paranoid. Also, by choosing freedom by leaving the confines of the ship, you end up confining your own crew in caves on the colony planet. Part 1 was an amazing ride, more than I could have wished for, but even so, it didn't prepare me for what was in store in Part 2. Everything is broken! What is going on? Where did the ship go? The nightmare about the spaceship? I didn't buy that one for a second. I knew this reality must be the fake one. And Dataplier Markiplier didn't seem to realize anything was wrong. I was determined to find a way to get us back to the Invincible 2 and keep trying to resolve that paradox. So I knew which choice I had to make. No matter how awful it was, we needed to face the reality of our situation and not let ourselves get trapped in fantasy. So I chose horror. The fake thumbnail options got me again. I was trying to decide between interview the suspects and inspect the body when I got jump-scared by the corpse waking up and yelling, please don't do this. And where did murder replier come from? I was starting to feel the regret hard for choosing the horror route. At the same time, I felt like I must be on the right track. Whatever anomaly was responsible for the time loop must have been trying to scare me away from the path to the solution. All the characters talking about many, many children, many, many cops, etc., sounded like they must have been referencing the many, many timelines in the time loop, and or the many, many universes in the multiverse. Finally, though, things glitched hard enough that I got kicked back into reality and ran into old Mark at the diner. I was still a little wary of his comical stabbing attempts, but listening to him talk was also very sad. I felt bad for him for feeling guilty about the time loop. I felt a little guilty myself hearing him take all the blame while he called me an excellent captain. I didn't feel like one. All my choices had led to disaster so far. But then he pointed out that I hadn't given up, and that was really heartwarming to hear, because I hadn't thought of it that way. Then, when old Mark said to tell him not to go back, I was instantly 1000% on board. He'd already seen what had happened, what would happen, and I just had to trust him and do my part. Now I had a mission, find the young version of Mark and tell him not to go back in time. You can count on me, old Mark. I won't let you down. I didn't know which way to go through the wormhole, so with nothing else to go on, I thought, maybe right is the right choice, and went to the right. Where in the world is Markiplier indeed? I was on a mission to find that man and give him the message from his older self. It looked like I'd slipped into another weird alternate reality. Getting bonjoured no less than seven times by the agents was an awesome callback to a date with Markiplier, by the way. I was getting the feeling that the detective in charge of the agency was actually Mark, but I didn't want to blow his cover. We were partners in crime in a heist, after all. So I played it cool and subtle, and said, Maybe Markiplier is in this very room. Oh no! Wubba shot Mark! And then everything broke again, and I was back in the wormhole. I'd gone to the right last time, and I didn't want to get lost going in circles by picking randomly. Also, the thumbnail for right was only a 47 second long video, which looked like it was just the right length to be a dead end, like in a heist with Markiplier. But I thought, what if it was just supposed to look that way to stop me from picking it? So again, I went to the right. What was a crew member doing in the airlock? As I've mentioned before, I'm not that observant when it comes to visual details, so I didn't even notice the images of doors flashing by from the sequence in part one where you choose whether or not to open the doors. But as I've also mentioned, I was trying to be a good captain. I wasn't just going to stand there and watch a member of my crew die on my watch. 
If it was a mistake to open the door, I'd cross that bridge when I came to it in a few seconds. But for now, I had to open the door. Oh, so it was a mistake. You're right, evil wug. Human stupid. But at least I know I did the right thing. I felt a bit called out by the ship's computer saying, Catastrophic, just the way you like it. I mean, it's not my fault. Okay, maybe it is my fault. Also, apparently Mark is Solid Snake now, and everything is guns and sick gymnastic flips. Okay, I see the computer's point. I did like this. Yes, lady, I'm trying to shut down the wormhole. But you've been getting in my way and being emotionally unstable at every step. Please, just let me fix everything. What do you mean you just took this from me? Well, that was something to look forward to. And then I was falling through the wormhole again. As soon as I heard Mark shout on your left just before crashing into me, I thought, This is a hint. It's an Easter egg telling me that I have to go to the left. But I didn't get the chance. Mark got swept away to the left, and I got funneled to the right. I was determined to go back for him the next chance I got, though. Meeting Lady again, all disheveled and defeated in the broken USA office, I was just thinking, this is it. This is their breaking point. I felt bad for them, but I definitely didn't trust them not to go crazy on me again with that gun at any moment. Give them the crystal? Not a chance! I needed to keep it if I still had any chance of fixing everything. And there it was, crazy gun time again. I wasn't even a little surprised. And then we both got sucked into the wormhole together. Of course I didn't want to destroy everything, but Lady got ripped away in another direction before I could tell them, if there was even anything I could have said that they'd believe. Poor Mark. I found him sitting there, wearing headphones and sobbing. And why not? We were stuck in a time loop. I was sure by this point my timeline and his were going in a different order. And who knows how many years of it he'd been through by this point. After all, I'd run into a much older version of Mark more than once, and I'd died of old age myself in some timelines. Eventually, the stress from that would be enough to make anyone cry. Technically, yes, there were two options. But aside from going through and exploring every choice for completionism's sake, there was really only one thing I could bring myself to say. It's okay, Mark. You can cry. I think getting to hug Mark while he cried was supposed to be at least a little comical, but I felt so bad for my shipmate who'd been working so hard with me to unravel all this chaos. I barely had time to think about it, though, before it was time to defuse a bomb with Markiplier. Another weird reality, where Mark didn't seem to remember what was going on, or even that we were supposed to be on the Invincible too. If I was going to cut a wire, I thought I should go with blue first, since it seemed like CUT THE RED WIRE was always the dramatic last wire to cut in the movies. But I realized this might be my only chance to give Mark his own message before it was too late, so I told him, Mark, you can't go back. It worked! I got through to him. That look in his eyes when he called me Captain. He was starting to remember. Then he glitched away again to somewhere and somewhen else. And a moment later, I did too. The ship was so dark and lonely and spooky this time. Old Mark still had a fight and fire in him, but this in-between, middle-aged Mark was so unhinged and clearly in so much pain. He'd obviously been the only one awake, maybe alive, on the Invincible for years in this timeline. It was hard to face him and I didn't have a good answer for betraying his trust when he saw the crystal, except to just keep trying to eventually undo all of this so it wouldn't ever have to happen to start with. Swept away by the wormhole once again, and I saw that Lady had the bandit cornered. They had obviously gone off the deep end, and I knew I couldn't just leave the bandit to deal with them on her own. I had to intervene. Well, that could have gone better. It could have gone worse, I suppose though I'm not exactly sure how. Saved by the warp crystal again, all of a sudden we were back on the Invincible 2, with time flowing in reverse. Reality was crumbling fast, and I still wasn't sure how to undo it. When time finally started moving forward again, Mark seemed to remember what was going on, 
But a split second later, everything exploded and we were sucked back into the wormhole. Finally! This was my chance to follow that hint from a few choices back and go left. I was so confused. Everything looked like a video game. Things were really going wild at this point. At least Mark was able to talk to Lady a bit and convince them we were trying to fix this before everything glitched and we fell into the wormhole again. I didn't give up. I trusted that I was making progress and chose left again. Now everything was puppets. All these alternate realities I kept getting swept away to were getting further and further from my home reality, and everything was so broken. And why did everyone keep pointing guns and lasers at us? And where was Mark? I did run into the scientist from a heist with Markiplier, at least, and hoped she might be able to help. But before we could find her lab, of course, it was back into the wormhole. I dug my heels in, put all my faith in what only might have been a hint, and one more time, chose to go left. There was no sign of Mark, but I was back in that blank black room with the warp core and lady, who looked in pretty rough shape. We had a heart to heart, and I heard them out. We talked about the end of everything, hope, and hamster wheels. They got a bit awkward and nerdy about human Earth movies at the end, but that was okay, too. Then the wormhole carried me away to the dark and empty diner. It was just me and old Mark now, sitting at that window booth again. And I just listened. And then I was alone. I took some of the sand Mark had left behind. Here at the end, even the narrator's voice was welcome as I made my way to the exit. I went through the door, and during less than half a minute, I witnessed years of what Mark had been doing through all these timelines during the times we'd been separated, overlapping each other all at once, working on wiring for the controls, sitting there in despair and exhaustion, trying to open the far door. How long did he spend stuck in this tiny room with nothing but his own thoughts and the warp core to work on? building the warp core, picking up and leaving off at different stages of completion as he must have been shifting into and out of the room at different times in random order, until finally he all stopped and stared at me, called out, Captain, and then Mark clobbered me across the skull. Fair. Deserved. Earned. If I were him, I'd probably do the same. With my vision still swimming from that blow on the head, I listened to Mark explain how the warp core worked. I was worried about what would happen now that I didn't have the crystal anymore. I needed to get it back to be able to keep trying to fix everything. Then Mark started talking about going back, and that's when I knew. This was what old Mark must have been talking about. I had to stop him. I absolutely lost it laughing at who throws sand. <laughs> oh, the irony. And then when he mentioned wishing he'd thought of a fake hand, I knew for sure this was a timeline that old Mark remembered. Finally, when he yelled, LET ME GO! I recognized that soundbite from the glitchy end credits of part one, when I had heard Mark yell, LET GO! This was obviously a very, very, very key turning point in our adventure. It was the one moment everything came down to. This choice was both the easiest and toughest one I made in my entire time as Captain of the Invincible 2. It was so hard to look Mark in the eyes while he pleaded with me to trust him and let go, but putting my faith in him also meant I had to trust what he had told me, would tell me years from now, earlier on when I ran into him in the diner. So I knew I had to hold on. I almost cried hearing Mark say, I know there's a perfect solution, I just have to find it. From the very beginning of part one, I'd been siding with, trusting, and relying on Mark every chance I got, and now I had to betray him to fix everything, and it broke my heart. I was overwhelmed with a feeling of relief hearing the warp core power down, saying, Paradox resolved. We'd done it! But Mark didn't realize that yet in what is probably the single best-acted scene in the entire In Space series. It was actually painful watching him suffer for those few moments before he realized what had happened, and what had been happening. When he said, I don't know if I've slept at all, then turned to me and asked, Have you? It hit me so hard. 
It was about two in the morning when I saw this scene for the first time, and I had been struggling with severe insomnia recently. I'd been going on around four to six hours of sleep a night for the last several days. While of course I wasn't happy that I had insomnia, I'm glad that if I was going to have it anyway, it lined up with my first playthrough of In Space. For some reason, it just made the experience feel that much more immersive and special. I also remember thinking that I hoped this was just really good acting, and that the real-life Mark Fishbach and the rest of the cast and crew of In Space were getting plenty of sleep while filming. Again, Mark took the blame for everything, but that didn't feel fair to me. He had been working just as hard, if not harder, than I had been all this time to fix everything. I'd been searching for information, and he'd been trying solutions. It took both of us to reach the answer. It was old Mark himself who finally figured out what needed to be done. I just carried it out. In the end, we saved the multiverse together. Without the warp core entrusting me with the crystal, I'd have never been able to travel through timelines and realities to begin with to be there to stop Mark from going back in the end. Then, everything ended. And started again for the last time. The crew reported in, and Bert dispensed some words of wisdom. We'd made it to the end of our journey, and at first, it seemed like I was the only one who could remember the time loop. But then, Mark quietly thanked me for not giving up on him, and I knew he remembered too. What an amazing end to such an amazing story! And just when the credits were wrapping up and I thought it was all over, Darkaplier finally made his appearance. Of course! The warp crystal was what was in the box in a heist with Markiplier. That explained so much about anomalies, shifting timelines, and even finding different items inside the box in that adventure. I did go back and explore all the routes for Part 2 that I didn't take on my first playthrough. But unlike with Part 1, after my adventure and getting the good end on my very first try, this really felt more like post-game exploration for completionism. I ran into Mr. Warfstash, and we scheduled that interview about my playthrough of a heist with Markiplier, though. Which reminds me, as soon as I finish making this video, I need to head on back to October 30th, 2019 for the interview. I hope I make it there on time, because I'm afraid I'm running a bit early and or late. And yes, in case you're wondering, I HAVE ranked my accomplices in order from most handsome to most beautiful. Anyway, I'm very happy with my first canon playthrough of Part 2. Even though I missed a lot of easter eggs and all the songs on my first playthrough, it's okay. I still got to see every last one of them when I went back through all the options. And as Ms. Whitaker said, I made some beautiful choices on my first playthrough. I've always wished it would be possible to go on an adventure with Q from Star Trek. That was my version of wanting a Hogwarts letter as a kid. The adventures with Markiplier series in general, and especially in space with Markiplier, have given me as close to that experience as I can imagine. It truly felt like being dropped into an episode of Star Trek and experiencing a time loop. Exploring options to gain more knowledge and work towards an eventual solution. Trusting in the idea that there would be a way to eventually undo everything. The disorientation hopping from timeline to timeline and reality to reality. Seeing the people around me reacting again and again, with memories being reset or changed, meeting people for the first time, and instantly knowing that they knew me from other timelines that they had seen, but I hadn't yet. I could talk and theorize about the alternate universes and how they actually work and make sense for hours. For example, I think the noir universe must have only one wavelength of light. That's why everything is in grayscale, because there's only shades of light and dark, and not a full spectrum of light. Or that the inner monologues in that universe are probably just a form of telepathy, since Mark mentioned in one of the routes that it was against the rules to listen in on his monologue when Lady did so, and the characters all seemed to be able to overhear each other's monologues. I'm not sure if that's something anyone would be interested in, though, so please let me know if it is. The production quality on In Space with Markiplier is absolutely incredible. The wormhole effect alone was absolutely on par with any sci-fi TV series I've seen like Star Trek, Babylon 5, or Stargate SG-1. It actually looks a lot like the Stargate wormhole. 
The makeup for Old Mark was amazing. I didn't even recognize that it was Mark at first. It took me a couple of seconds to realize it. While it was obviously makeup on a young actor, it was still really well done, especially around the eyes. It was also done with enough subtlety that Mark's expressions came through beautifully while he was acting scenes as that version of the character. The entire backwards-moving scene was just amazing! It was super hard to tell at first whether it was filmed in reverse, or filmed normally and then reversed later. I'm almost positive it was filmed with everyone actually acting everything out in reverse, though. They did a marvelous job! Even leaving aside the songs for a moment, the sound design throughout the whole story was astounding. Background music, sound effects, the voices of the actors, just everything. As for the songs themselves, I haven't been able to stop listening to them since finishing In Space with Markiplier. Space was cool just couldn't have been any more perfect. Mark is an amazing singer. It was absolutely beautiful. And I don't really think there's anything else I can say about it besides that. When I explored the other routes and finally met up with Yancey, I didn't realize that the song he was singing with the other prisoners was The Last Goodbye. I was trying to read lips to get a hint as to lyrics, but I had to give up. I only found out because I saw a video someone had uploaded to YouTube with the scene synced up to the song. It was absolutely hilarious that Yancey totally forgot about the phone so we couldn't hear him singing. But I also think, in a way, it sends a beautiful message. Just like how we don't get to hear Yancey and the prison gang singing The Last Goodbye, there's no possible way for any one of us to get to experience everything. And the full version of The Last Goodbye from the credits was just an absolutely fantastic way to end the story. The line, one tragic end to a million stories, is my favorite, and it will stay with me for a long time. Somehow, after In Space with Markiplier, even the idea of the eventual heat death of the universe, or everything in existence ending for whatever reason, doesn't seem so scary anymore. Just extremely beautiful and sad. This doesn't mean that I mind the idea any less than I did before, just that I can face it without feeling as afraid. There's an entire multiverse of possibilities before us, and an entire universe of memories behind us. In Space with Markiplier was so cool, and now it will live in millions of memories, including my own.